Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you once again for being here with us today. And uh, as usual, I have Dr. Joe Canner from LDH uh, with me, and he'll be speaking to you in a few moments and take your questions. Uh, today is a relatively good day on the news that we have with respect to COVID, but particularly with respect to the increasing allocations of vaccine doses uh, going forward uh, starting next week. Um, and, uh, you know, I think uh, we're going to get to a place starting Monday that we thought we would be a few weeks from now uh, moving to it. Uh, and that's an indication of these increased doses. And we know this because yesterday we were on a call with the White House and uh, received positive news about vaccine shipments, vaccine shipments. And next week, Louisiana is slated to get more than 148,000 first doses uh, in, a dose, in addition to all the doses that would come as second doses. Uh, but also, in addition to that, uh, there are uh, doses that are going to go directly to the retail pharmacy program, which is a federal program, and to federally qualified health centers. Uh, so the vaccination effort really is expanding in a robust fashion. Um, you know, for example, next week, I think the total increase in Johnson & Johnson is 26,600. Um, it's about 14,000 or so more Pfizer. Um, so in light of this news, I'm announcing today that beginning on Monday, March the 29th, uh, COVID-19 vaccine eligibility will be open to everyone 16 and older. It doesn't matter about health condition, doesn't matter about occupation. Uh, 16 years and older uh, will be the determining factor for eligibility. This is welcome news. It's a little bit of a surprise to get here as soon as we did. Um, we knew that we were getting close and we had signaled that, um, but we didn't know we would be here uh, when we, uh, actually Monday, when we started the week. Uh, as you know, our goal has always been uh, to get as many shots in arms as possible and to use every dose at, as it arrives, um, or at least with, within that week. A shot sitting on a shelf or in a freezer is not doing anything to help us end the pandemic. Since the beginning of the vaccine process, our weekly allocations from the federal government have more than doubled. And that is why we feel confident that we're ready for this next step. You may remember that a couple of weeks ago, the president announced that he wanted us to take this step by May the 1st. I told you that I thought we would beat that. Um, I didn't realize that we would be doing it uh, quite this soon, however. Uh, as we get closer to Monday, when all this will go into effect, I, I'm asking people to be patient uh, with the enrolled providers as they make uh, their appointments available. Uh, they have been just tremendous partners with us and their efforts have been Herculean uh, to make sure that people are able to schedule appointments and actually receive their vaccine doses. And they are working as fast as they can uh, every week to change uh, to adapt to changes on, on the ground and so forth. Um, just as a reminder, while we have opened eligibility starting money to everyone 16 and above, only the Pfizer vaccine is currently approved for ages 16 and 17. Uh, 18 and above is approved for Pfizer, for Moderna, and for Johnson and & Johnson. Also, you must make an appointment um, and at the time you make the appointment, you will know which vaccine is being administered. Uh, and so I, you need to pay attention to that, especially if you are 16 or 17 years old. Uh, we're asking you to go to uh, covidvaccine.la.gov. And that's where you will get the, the list of all of the enrolled providers, the vaccine locations in your parish or in any parish that you might want to go to. Uh, you'll have access to phone numbers. You're going to have access to email and so forth. Uh, I want to make sure that everybody uh, understands that all three vaccines are safe. All three vaccines are effective. Uh, and that uh, in the very, well, in, in the not too distant future, I should say, uh, we're going to have enough doses for everybody who wants one. Uh, what, what we need to do is make sure that everybody wants one. Um, because doses 
in and of themselves do nothing to end the pandemic, but vaccinations will. Uh, and so that turns on having the doses, making them available in the right locations, making them accessible, uh, and then making sure that we're doing the outreach necessary uh, so that people feel confident about being vaccinated. Uh, we do remain uh, in a race, obviously, against time and against the variants, but principally the UK variant, the B117, uh, that is present in Louisiana and elsewhere around the country, and one that is um, growing in its prevalence and is still expected to become the predominant strain of the virus in circulation soon. And as we, as we have been telling you, is more transmissible, but it also is more violent. Uh, and so we're in a race against that. We need people to continue to do what they can to slow transmission by wearing masks and wear, by distancing, but also by getting that vaccine as soon as they are eligible with whichever vaccine is available to them first. So come Monday, nobody needs to ask the question as to whether they are eligible. They just need to know their age. If they are 16 and older, they are eligible. So please work with one of our providers, uh, get an appointment, help end this pandemic, protect yourself, protect your loved ones, and be part of the effort to bring back Louisiana. Last week, I announced our statewide grassroots effort to meet people where they are, to break down barriers, to engage in this outreach on a comprehensive level, and to ensure that people have meaningful opportunities to get the vaccine. Since then, more than 300 people have volunteered to help us, and I'm looking forward uh, to their efforts. If you would still like to join us in this effort, and we certainly hope that you will, if you have something to offer, uh, please visit lava.dhh.louisiana.gov. That is lava.dhh.louisiana.gov. Dr. Kander is going to have some more information in a moment about the pilot programs that we announced uh, that, that are upcoming. On today's report with respect to COVID, we're reporting 524 new cases on 17,423 new tests. Sadly, we are reporting 19 deaths. I got excited. I mean, this will kind of tell you where we are. Yesterday, I think we reported seven. Uh, and just to be in the single digits, I, I felt good about that. Today, we're reporting 19 new deaths. Um, and of course, one is too many. But we're now at 10,056 deaths since the start of the pandemic here in Louisiana. Um, it is a hard number to swallow. And as we've mentioned before, you know, those aren't just numbers. Those are people. Those are Louisianans. Those are brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and grandparents and grandchildren and aunts and uncles. There are co-workers, our friends, the church members, all of those sorts of things. So let's, let's certainly remember that. And let's dedicate ourselves again to making sure that going forward, as few people die from COVID as possible. There are currently 413 people hospitalized across the state of Louisiana. That's up by nine. Um, you know, we, we uh, since January the 8th, we're on a very steady decline downward. Uh, we have certainly plateaued recently over the last seven to 10 days in our hospitalizations, again, up uh, today uh, by nine. It would be really great to get backwards on a downward trajectory again. 75 of those 413 patients are on the mechanical ventilators. Uh, that is up one since yesterday. Statewide positivity is hanging steady at right at 2.8%. Uh, that number is certainly better than it was uh, in early January uh, when it was close to 15%. For the past few weeks, we've been praising our low case numbers and hospitalizations. Um, and certainly I would much rather, rather report the numbers we're reporting now than we were reporting uh, several weeks ago. Uh, we have had positive trends. Uh, but the entire picture, unfortunately, isn't so rosy. Uh, we've been telling you for the last couple of weeks about some alarming indicators coming out of the southwest region of Louisiana, Region 5. Uh, and I can tell you that it has the highest positivity 
uh, in the state right now, positivity, meaning the percentage of tests yielding a positive result, has increased over the week from 6.6% to 11.9%, so almost doubling. Secondly, uh, over the last month, uh, they are up in hospitalizations. There are 25 more people hospitalized over the last month uh, in Region 5. Uh, and, and that is contrary to what's happening elsewhere in the state where every other region is either declining or flat. And if you will remember, we told you that the number of cases confirmed and suspected of the UK variant were, were uh, uh, disproportionately uh, in Region 5. And certainly we believe all of this is linked. And I don't want people who are not in Region 5 to breathe a sigh of relief and say, oh, well, that's, that's down in the Lake Charles area. Uh, that's not the way pandemics work. Uh, and so we know that this variant is, is everywhere, and we know that it's going to be growing in prevalence everywhere, and we need people to be uh, vigilant. Uh, for more on this, uh, as well as bring back Louisiana, uh, the campaign that we talked about last week, uh, and to address whatever questions you have, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Canner, and then I'll be back up with you in just a minute. Thank you, Governor. Thank you for your leadership. Good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to be with you. Um, I'll pick up right uh, where the governor left off. Um, <clears throat> overall, um, the state's uh, progress uh, has, has stalled in terms of reducing transmission. We've made some really good progress over the past month and a half. Um, and over the past week or two, it seems to have, uh, have leveled off, which, you know, in listening to Dr. Fauci and other experts, oftentimes can be a, a warning sign that people need to be you know, increasing their, their vigilance and, and being very careful. Um, I have particular concern in Region 5, which is the Lake Charles area. And uh, the governor mentioned percent positivity has increased, almost doubled from 6.6 .6 to 11.9%. They've been increasing in case incidents. That's the number of new COVID cases diagnosed day by day. That's been increasing for the past five weeks, fairly steadily. Um, and it's tough because Region 5, the Lake Charles area, has had a really hard go of it this year. Um, and the folks have, who live there have, have been through an awful lot. Um, and, and COVID probably isn't top of mind for a lot of people that are trying to repatriate there and rebuild their homes and lives. And I think we all understand that. But um, with the numbers we're seeing now with the transmission that's occurring in that area, I'm going to make a specific ask to, to folks who live in the Region 5 area to um, focus the next few weeks on remaining as vigilant as possible, uh, masking, distancing, and um, now get vaccinated. Um, very, very thankful that as of this coming Monday, every adult, every 16-year-old and above in Louisiana will be eligible to get vaccinated. This is a great milestone that we are approaching, really tremendous milestone, and that we can do it th this early really um, is, is very fortuitous to, it, to us, that we have enough doses coming our way to be able to enable that. We just gotta make sure that we capitalize on that so people need to get vaccinated. The um, variants continue to grow um, in Louisiana as they do across the country. So to date on the B117 variant, that's the one that was first identified in the UK, we have 164 confirmed and presumed cases um, in the state. 96 of those 164 are in the Region 5 area, in the Lake Charles area. Um, we know, and we've talked about this many times, because the US just doesn't do a whole lot of genomic sequencing, we know that when you have 164 cases, that's, that's truly tip of the iceberg, and there's many, many more there that you just haven't formally identified yet. The CDC estimates that of every COVID virus circulating in Louisiana, right now 3.5% are the B117 or UK variant. That's up a little bit from the week prior. This data what the CDC puts out is on a couple-week lag. So it's as of a couple weeks ago, 
without question, that number, that 3.5% is higher right now. I have absolutely no doubt in that. To compare with our neighbors, Texas is at 7.1% and Florida is at 13.2%. Um, we're at risk of getting there if we don't continue to mask and distance. Um, also, if we don't get the vaccine out as quick as we have the opportunity to do so. In some of the other variants of concern, we, we still have no identified cases in Louisiana. So of the B1351 variant, that's the South African variant, it has been identified in 27 states comprising 219 cases, none of which are in Louisiana. The closest to us are Texas, Florida, Georgia, North and South Carolina, Tennessee, and now Mississippi has a case as well. That's new this week. For the P1 variant, that's the Brazilian variant, we also have no identified cases in Louisiana. It has been identified in 18 states, the closest to us being Texas, Oklahoma, Florida, and Georgia. Particularly with this B117, the, the UK variant, we know it is more transmissible, perhaps 50% more transmissible. We know it's more virulent, meaning it's more likely to make somebody sick enough to be hospitalized. And we know it's gonna to continue to spread. So Lake Charles area is clearly on the leading edge of this for the state, but as the governor said, it's not isolated to Lake Charles. And if we're not careful over these next few weeks, and if we're not as aggressive as possible with vaccinations, the increases in Lake Charles are at risk of spreading throughout the state. So this is a warning sign to us right now that we gotta double down our efforts, both in mitigating measures, masking and distancing, and in getting the vaccine out as quickly and equitably as possible. Um, I am very encouraged that supply is increasing substantially next week, and we have reason to believe that it will continue to do so going forward. So um, for next week's allocations from the federal government, and this will be week 16 um, of the vaccine rollout series. So it, it is pretty remarkable by week 16, we're able to expand eligibility to, to every adult in Louisiana. Uh, we will be getting um, 77,220 doses of Pfizer. That's an increase of 15,210 from this current week. We'll be getting 45,000 doses of Moderna. That's a flat number from this current week. We'll be getting 26,600 doses of Johnson & Johnson. That's a substantial increase from the um, 5,000 or so doses we got this current week, giving a total um, state allocation proper of 148,820 first doses. Additionally to that, this week we are completing a clawback of 32,010 doses that we initially diverted to the long-term care program that they're not gonna end up using. So those will be added to our, um, our in-state allocation as well. These doses put us in a really good position and certainly enable us to expand eligibility as of Monday. With full eligibility uh, on Monday, um, folks need to know that this is, this is our time. No one needs to ask themselves if they're eligible. No one needs to parse the list of essential workers and see if they qualify or not. No one has to talk to their doctor and see if they have one of the eligible conditions. Anyone 16 years of age in Louisiana and older as of Monday is gonna be eligible to go get vaccinated, get in line, get an appointment. We have sufficient supply. And now it's on all of us to make sure that that happens, to make sure that we capitalize on that opportunity. Uh, looking ahead, um, there's gonna be more work to do on, on outreach, and, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, one thing I'm, I'm happy to announce is that we'll be putting out some more granular information on the dashboard, the LDH COVID uh, and the COVID vaccine dashboard tomorrow. You'll be able to go on the dashboard and see demographic and vaccine administration data by census tract, which is a very granular um, marking. It's, 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 a, it's a smaller, it's a more granular entity than zip codes are. So for each census tract in the state, you'll be able to look at how many doses have been administered, how many uh, series have been completed, and you'll be able to see that based on key demographic items like race. We are going to be using this data to guide where outreach effort has to happen, where we put our resources. And that brings me to the Bring Back Louisiana campaign, which I'm so very excited about because this is how we're gonna connect 
vaccine to every corner of the state, particularly corners that need it most by virtue of social vulnerability or by virtue of not having enough people vaccinated already. We'll be looking at this data very closely. I'm very excited to announce right now the first nine uh, pilot sites of the Bring Back Louisiana campaign. They will be in the following uh, zip codes. In Region 1, they'll be in the 70127 zip code in New Orleans East. In Region 2, in the 70807 zip code in East Baton Rouge. In Region 3, in the 70353 zip code in Terrebonne. In Region 4, in the 70582 zip code of St. Martin. In Region 5, in the 70668 zip code of Calcasieu. In Region 6, in the 71302 zip code in Rapides. In Region 7, in the 71107 zip code of Cato. In Region 8, in the 71241 zip code of Union Parish. And in Region 9, in the 703, excuse me, 70431 zip code in St. Tammany. Uh, these zip codes were selected by virtue of social vulnerability and um, particular need and progress in vaccinations. They cover both urban areas and rural and farm communities. And this is just the beginning of the Bring Back Louisiana campaign. Outreaching these zip codes will start next week, and then the campaign launches fully thereafter. Again, just the beginning, but very, very excited. This is a novel campaign. It's something that Louisiana is leading on, and it's marrying direct outreach, both canvassing and phone calls, with local community-based organizations, with targeted vaccine events. And again, we're going to be looking to this campaign to really connect people with vaccine in the areas of the state that need it most. Looking ahead, um, I want to say a couple comments about the Easter holidays and um, um, springtime and, and you know, what, what we can and probably shouldn't do in the weeks and month or two ahead. Um, I think slowly, slowly we're going to see life um, get back to normal, but there are some things that we have to do and we have to be very, very cautious in that. Let me start with what you can do um, when you get vaccinated. And um, it's more than just getting a free donut. So when you can get vaccinated, you can uh, visit with other fully vaccinated people indoors in a private setting without masking and distancing. That means with your family, with close friends, if every, if every person in that small private group is fully vaccinated, we mean 14 days out from their um, serious completion, then that gathering can happen without masking and distancing, can safely happen without masking and distancing. You can visit with unvaccinated individuals from one additional household if everyone else in that gathering, that private gathering, is fully vaccinated safely without masking and distancing. And you can refrain from quarantining following an exposure to someone else who has COVID if you're fully vaccinated and you have no symptoms. So if families are asking themselves how they can celebrate the Easter holiday safely, how can they have a dinner with family safely, how can they boil crawfish safely, the answer right now is go get vaccinated. For yourself, go get vaccinated. For your friends and family, go get vaccinated. That is the ticket to be able to have these gatherings safely. I have to say that because there is still transmission occurring, and I'll note that in the state, there are currently nine parishes that still have the highest rank of community transmission risk, nine in Louisiana. There still is a lot of virus circulating. You still need to wear masks and distance when you're in public settings. But when you're in private, in a small gathering of friends and family, and everyone else is fully vaccinated, you can now safely do that without masking and without distancing. Um, a lot of people have reached out and want to help with the efforts, want to help with the Bring Back Louisiana campaign. And this is really heartening work, or heartening news, because this is going to be a you know, community-wide effort. We're going to need everyone. If anyone is interested in helping, and we are eager to have volunteers, in addition to the 21 um, organizations that we're partnering with, 
If you're interested to help, you can go to covidvaccine.la.gov and there'll be a link towards the top of that page that says, how can I volunteer? That link will take you to the Louisiana Volunteers in Action LAVA page, which will help you enroll. We will be calling on these volunteers as we stand up outreach events and community vaccination events throughout the state of Louisiana. Um, let me close by, by making one concerted ask to people um, in two parts. And the first part is uh, starting Monday, if you're 16 and above, go get vaccinated. Go make an appointment, get in line, and get vaccinated. And the second part of this ask is, if you've already done that, thank you, but your job is not done because I want you to go be an ambassador to your friends and family. Get your parents vaccinated, get your siblings vaccinated, get your cousins vaccinated, get your friends vaccinated be an ambassador, that is how we are going to achieve herd immunity. I can tell you right now, 23.5% of the state's population has at least initiated a vaccine series, 13.8% has completed that series, and we can do better than that. So if you've already done it yourself, thank you. Go get your friends and family covered. Be happy to answer any questions. Yep, Sam. and these rural parishes seem to be lagging some of the more populated places and the share of population that's been vaccinated. And some of these people in these parishes have basically said that no matter how much outreach you do, a lot of this is just, you know, it can be political beliefs or beliefs about health care that they're just not going to get vaccinated ever. Do you still think that reaching herd immunity in each community is a realistic possibility or goal? I do. Um, I do. I don't think that it's not a, uh, no switch gets flipped when we reach herd immunity. And what I mean by that is I think there's tangible progress before we hit to that mark. And there's still some debate about what exact percentage coverage confers herd immunity. There is still significant progress that happens before we get that. But to the larger um, point of that question, I, I really do, and uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, the polling data is encouraging. And, and even in areas where there is less vaccine confidence, the trend is in the right direction. And it seems that as time goes on and more and more people get vaccinated and people know about that, vaccine confidence goes up. The other reason that I'm encouraged is when we talk to individuals, and when we do focus groups, we actually don't hear a lot of, I'm not going to do it, period. We really don't. What we hear much more of is, I don't know. I'm unsure. I'm on the fence. I, I want to wait and see. I want to talk to people, which tells us that we have an opportunity to have that conversation, that people just need to be connected with facts, need to be connected with experts, need to have an opportunity to have those questions answered. And the point of this Bring Back Louisiana campaign is to allow people that opportunity to have those questions answered. So I, I really am encouraged that those percentages go up. I just know we have our work cut out for us to get there. So a big reason that um, you guys have expanded eligibility over um, the past few times is because you guys said that uh, you know that there are a lot of like vaccines sitting on shelves and everything. Um, so I was wondering if you had the numbers on hand for how many vaccines have gone to waste, not because of you know an outage or you know something like that, but just because you know a pharmacy or a hospital just couldn't find enough people to administer it to, if any. Uh, question being. How many have, have been wasted just by virtue of expiring? I don't have, I, I can probably get back to you on a number. I can tell you the total loss number right now is 1,946. That's of all doses, you know, sent down to the state. Um, I, I don't know offhand how many of those, some number of those, I think it's a minority of those were just expired because someone couldn't be found, but it's not the majority of that number. Anybody? Yeah, Melinda? point of is herd immunity realistic it seems like okay so y'all are clawing back 32,000 doses from the long-term care program which seems to be because nursing home employees are not interested in using them so isn't that an indicator that that there is going to be a broader problem in reaching 
um, the large numbers that you need. It's, I mean, we're already hearing about appointments that don't get filled. So I guess I'm wondering, how do you combat how do you combat that in a way that gets you to herd immunity before the doses before the variant overtakes the available doses and it doesn't really matter anymore? Yeah, that really is the challenge that you articulated there. I mean, we we and the governor said this last week. We're in a race against time right now. We're in a race to get vaccine out as quickly and equitably as possible because the variants are out there. Um, you know the. What the clawback was from the long-term care, there really was, you know, the feds did an estimate of how much they wanted to, to divert there. Some of the staff there got vaccinated through other avenues, you know, not in the first round, but as, as time went on. So it, it really was an estimate. I, I, don't, I don't view that as predictive of what's happening in the community. It also was the first few weeks. And vaccine confidence, you know, has, has grown, not at the pace I would like it to, but it's certainly grown as the, as the vaccine administration endeavor has gone on. So I, I really am encouraged that confidence continues to increase, that more and more people get vaccinated. I'm just not naive that it's going to happen automatically. I think it's very clear right now to us, it's, and it should be clear to everyone, that there's going to be a lot of work that has to happen between now and then. A, a lot of outreach, a lot of um, connecting with people, meeting people where they're at, and letting people have questions answered. Um, we have the opportunity to do it. I mean, it's, it's kind of within, um, within our hands right now. I, I really do think we'll get there. I just know it's gonna be a lot of work to get there. Yeah, Sam? It seems like uh, demand and supply depends a lot on where you live. Are you guys seeing that maybe in Orleans Parish, there's still a ton of demand and long wait times, and then in some, you know, maybe rural parts or even suburban areas outside of there, uh, it's pretty easy to get a dose? Uh, it's pretty variable. Um, even in, you know, Region 1 or Orleans has, has administered the most vaccines per capita right now. But I even with that, it, it's relatively easy. You can get an appointment within a couple of days' time. So um, I think in terms of is this the right time to expand eligibility, I, I think it is, particularly with the increased doses coming down. I think there's no question that there's geographic variability right now in, in vaccine uptake. And you can go on, on the front page of the vaccine dashboard and, and see that pretty, pretty clearly. I mean, to me, that just means that we have, we have an opportunity. We, we have more work to do. And again, I'm, the point of putting all that data out there is to know where we need to hone in with the outreach effort. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kenner, and, and I continue to appreciate your work and that of everybody at LDH and all of our partners around the state. Um, you know, this month we mark a full year in the battle against COVID-19. And there are a lot of heroes out there, but chief among them are our healthcare professionals. Uh, and I know that they're tired. Uh, and I know that, that they uh, would very much appreciate putting this pandemic behind us so that they can go to work and experience some normalcy too. Um, and we need to do that. And with respect to the questions around herd immunity, you know, we, we've been saying for many months now that everybody has a role to play in slowing the transmission, flattening the curve, making sure they're protecting themselves and their neighbors and so forth. And, and, and until recently, that was principally directed at distancing and masking and washing your hands and staying home when you're sick. Everybody has a role to play now, and it's getting vaccinated. And that vaccine starting Monday will be available uh, to everyone who is 16 and older. And so I'm asking people to do what is necessary. And don't sit back with the calculation, well, I'm just going to let other people be vaccinated so that at some point we get to this so-called herd immunity uh, because if enough people take that approach, we're not going to get there. And secondly, when we do, it isn't like the coronavirus and COVID-19 are going to go away completely. That's not going to happen. And people who are not vaccinated are going to continue to be susceptible to contracting the disease, getting sick, being hospitalized, and dying. 
And so it really is counterproductive for people to talk about herd immunity in that fashion uh, as if we're just going to sit back and wait and let other people get vaccinated and we'll benefit from that. You're always going to be at greater risk if that's what you do. And therefore, your family is going to be at greater risk if that's what you do. So we all have a role to play now. That role has changed somewhat since vaccines have been administered to the states. It is still important. If you're not in that situation that Dr. Cantor described and that the CDC has sanctioned about being in a small gathering where 100% of the people are uh, fully vaccinated and you're able to take off your mask and, and not worry about social distancing, it is important that you continue to wear your mask. It's, continued, it's important that you continue to distance and it's really important that you get vaccinated. Last week when I spoke, uh, I was a day early and I mentioned that the CDC uh, had changed uh, its guidance on the safe operation of schools with respect to students, social distancing at six feet uh, when they are all masked. Uh, and in fact, on Friday, they did uh, what I mentioned and that is reduce that to three feet. Um, I did have the opportunity to speak to a young student at Hammond Westside Montessori School named Evan. Uh, and we had a conversation this week and he was excited about how this represents one more step back uh, to normalcy. And in fact, it does. And I envisioned that there would be many small steps uh, that, that we take o over time uh, on our journey back to uh, normal. Uh, I'll take questions in just a moment. I do want to talk a little bit about the weather. We've been under a flash flood and severe weather watch since Tuesday. That flash flood watch will remain in effect for all of southeast Louisiana through midnight on Thursday. Uh, because of that, two testing sites are closed today. That's the, those are the sites at Alario and at Nichols. Um, and the sites at UNO and Mahalia were delayed in opening. Uh, we're going to continue to keep the public updated on weather-related disruptions as it relates to testing. The good news thus far is that we have not experienced any weather-related deaths or injuries, haven't had power outages reported uh, with this most recent weather either. Uh, but the ground is saturated. A quick burst of heavy rain could cause additional flooding uh, pretty quickly. And we know that winds can easily cause trees to fall uh, onto houses and cars and power lines and so forth when the ground is saturated. Uh, the New Orleans region experienced street flooding yesterday and last night. Uh, also anywhere from 8 to 10 inches of rain fell in St. Charles, Lafouche, and Terrebonne parishes. Uh, 21 structures uh, that we know of were flooded, the majority of which were in Lafouche. Uh, damage assessments are underway. There are still multiple road closures, closures in those parishes. Um, in Lafouche, pumps are operational. Parish field offices have pre-filled sandbags for those residents who might need them. Uh, as a result, uh, I'm sorry, as the threat of more flash flooding continues, I cannot stress enough uh, that if you see water on the road, uh, please do not attempt to drive through it if you're not absolutely sure how deep it is and that you can safely navigate through it. Um, and don't try to go around it. That's when you'll end up in a ditch. Uh, turn around and go the other way uh, as best you can. Um, this is where many drownings occur historically, and we don't want that to happen. For real-time information on road closures, please go to 511LA.org. There is also a slight risk for severe weather statewide, uh, not just in southeast Louisiana. Potential impacts could include damaging wind gusts in excess of 60 miles per hour. Uh, tornadoes are possible, as, as is hail. We encourage everyone to stay alert. Heat instructions from your local officials and weather experts. Uh, please keep your cell phones charged and on because many times that's how you're going to get the last possible notice of an approaching tornado. Please make certain you have a game plan in place. You can always visit getagameplan.org for more information. Uh, lastly, today is equal pay day. Uh, I am supporting my red tie in support of equal pay. Louisiana, uh, unfortunately, uh, remains at the very bottom of the country when it comes to equal pay for women here 
who own who earn 72 cents on the dollar on average. Um, and for women of color, the numbers are even worse. Uh, black women earn 49 cents on the dollar. Latino women earn 53 cents on the dollar. We should all be outraged by this, and, and uh, we need to fix it. And of course, we will once again uh, present bills to the legislature in the upcoming session that will address this. And I am committed, as ever, uh, to ending pay inequity. I know that when women succeed, Louisiana succeeds as well. So with that, I will take some questions. Yes, sir. Governor, obviously with no more um, expansions of eligibility really uh, to be made and with the supply versus demand issue quelled, at least for the time being, does combating hesitancy, which the state has done in some form those whole four months or nearly four months, does that really come to the forefront now that everybody's eligible, that hesitancy is the next chapter of this pandemic? Well, I think that's that's the uh, right way to frame it. Uh, and of course, we've anticipated that we would get to this point at, at some time. Um, and not just in Louisiana, but around the country, every state and the federal government as well, all looking at plans uh, to address this. And what we know is that people who remain hesitant today, they lack confidence. Um, they really want to hear from someone in their community, uh, perhaps a physician who is trusted, um, somebody who has credibility in talking about the importance of being vaccinated, that these vaccines are in fact safe, they are in fact effective, they're the only way to end the pandemic, that people will protect themselves and others by being vaccinated, uh, and, and then have an opportunity to ask questions and receive answers to those questions. And then we know that uh, confidence increases, hesitancy diminishes, and more people get vaccinated. Uh, so this, we always knew that we'd, we would reach a point where outreach uh, was gonna be critically important. Uh, we we uh, are just about there. In fact, you can see that, that our re outreach efforts are uh, reaching a new level. Uh, and you're going to see many more manifestations of this over the coming weeks and months because we have to get people vaccinated. Um, and, and I am not at all um, at, at the point where, where I, I believe that, uh, that we're going to fail to get enough people vaccinated. Uh, we just have some work to do. Uh, like Dr. Cantor, uh, every reliable survey indicates that confidence is growing over time, not as fast as we would like. Hesitancy is diminishing over time, again, not as fast as we would like. But from the very beginning, a relatively few people have been saying they will never get the vaccine. Most have said, we just don't want it now. Um, and, and maybe they were saying that back in December and January. Well, now we're getting towards the end of March, about to be in April. Uh, they've had an opportunity now to see their friends and neighbors and relatives uh, vaccinated um, in large numbers, and, and they can see the safety of the vaccine for themselves. And the efficacy numbers really should speak for themselves. The highest percentage of people anywhere vaccinated are nursing home residents. Nursing home cases are at an all-time low. The two things are related. The vaccine works. It confers immunity from COVID-19 uh, on 95% of the people who get vaccinated, and it, it uh, protects against hospitalization and death uh, for 100%. So this is our way forward. Uh, so I, nothing, nothing that has developed is was unanticipated. Uh, no, nothing is um, overly troubling, but we just all have some work to do. But at the end of the day, nobody's going to be able to make that decision for you. And I'm talking to the people of Louisiana. I strongly encourage you to make this decision for yourself and reach out to your physician uh, if, if you have questions. And then in the meantime, we're going to be trying to give you as much information as possible and then to make available to you uh, people who can answer your questions. Yes, sir. Why do you think that is? Is that a 
lack of confidence that you've talked about? And if so, why are Louisianans less confident about the vaccine than some other states? Yeah, yeah no, I, I don't know. Um, and there are different ways uh, to measure that, and, I, and I'm not sure which measure you're, you're looking at and whether you're looking only at, for example, of the vaccines that come to the state or whether you're including the vaccines that the federal government is administering directly through the VA system, for, for example. But I'm not going to quibble with the number. We, we want more people to be vaccinated. The doses are here. We have all the enrolled partners that we need. There are vaccines available every day in every parish. There's appointments available. Uh, we, we just need to get people uh, to be vaccinated. Uh, and and we're going to do everything that we can uh, to facilitate that. And we need people at the local level uh, to do that as well. Um, and, and certainly we're, we were never going to be satisfied whether we were first in the country or, or 50th in the country uh, with, with where we are. We, we always want to do better. Yes, ma'am. Um, on, a, on a different subject, um, the attorney general filed a lawsuit um, against the Biden administration over the moratorium on new oil and gas exploration on federal lands and waters. And I know you have been critical of that moratorium. Do you think a lawsuit is the appropriate way to move forward on that? Well, I haven't had the, I was told about the lawsuit just before walking in. I, I haven't had an opportunity to look at it and certainly the attorney general didn't call and discuss it with me. In the meantime, I have been uh, engaging in outreach to stakeholders here in Louisiana and elsewhere um, about the, the moratorium and, and what it means for us, especially as it relates to the Gulf. Um, and then I've also been in conversations with various officials in the Biden administration, including earlier this week when I was elected chairman of the governor's group on the Outer Continental Shelf and uh, had an opportunity to speak to the director of BOEM about it, um, and everyone acknowledges that enough leases were stockpiled uh, that a, a moratorium, a pause on leasing is not uh, going to be injurious to the industry or to jobs or so forth. The short-term impact uh, would have been most heavily felt uh, on the permitting side if the companies weren't allowed to explore for and produce oil and gas on the leases that they had. Uh, and I'm gratified to say um, that, and I know this because I've been talking to oil and gas CEOs and, and interest groups, but also uh, to the director of BOEM this week, that those permits have started to be issued too. Uh, so just as you're starting to uh, have the communications get you to a point where, where you're feeling better about things and the permits are being issued, probably isn't the best time uh, to file litigation, um, but obviously that that's taken place. I haven't, I haven't read it. I'll, all I'm going to tell you is I will continue to do uh, the outreach that I've been engaged in uh, with the Biden administration to make sure that, that they understand that the most carbon advantaged barrel of oil produced anywhere in the world is produced in the Gulf of Mexico. That demand for oil is inelastic, meaning it doesn't respond to changes in supply. And oil is going to be produced somewhere and it's going to be used in our economy uh, throughout whatever transition we have away from fossil fuels. It could be decades in the making. And whatever time frame that is, we need to position Louisiana to take full advantage of the industry here in our state, uh, but we also need to take advantage of the opportunity we have to uh, develop investments uh, in renewable energy uh, and in that move away from fossil fuels so that uh, when, you know, for example, we're going to be refining uh, diesel out of things like corn and soybean and, and pine trees. Uh, so, so we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, I don't know how this litigation that you referenced advances our goals, but we'll see. Yes, sir. Uh, since last press conference, uh, the Women's Select Committee said they were going to hold a Second hearing on the LSU sexual assault cases. Uh, they said that if uh, higher officials don't implement policies that um, that automatically fire officials and faculty who don't like report sexual assault or follow Title IX procedures. Um, so I was wondering if that was something that you know you support or you know your comment on that. Yeah. So I've actually um, had meetings uh, this week with several groups of legislators, including two groups of legislators today. 
and and had um, uh, a discussion just before the the press conference. I was on a Zoom call uh, with a women's group as well, and announced that that we will have as part of our legislative package a bill uh, that addresses mandatory reporting uh, on higher education campuses, identifies who the mandatory reporters are and imposes on them obviously that obligation to, to report and then absent some very compelling reasons, any failure to discharge that obligation would result in termination. So that is, that is something that we've already looked at and, and put into our uh, legislative package and we'll be asking the legislature to move that bill forward uh, and to get it to my desk. Look, I wanna thank you all for continuing to cover uh, all of these things that are so important to the people of our state uh, and, and we are in a better place than, than we were uh, just a few weeks ago, but there are some troubling signs out there, uh, principally with respect to uh, case growth and hospitalizations in Southwest Louisiana, uh, the, the variant which is obviously having an impact there uh, and we know elsewhere across the state. Uh, and as that strain of the virus grows in terms of its prevalence, uh, we need to be making sure that more people are getting vaccinated as soon as possible. That is possible now for everyone 16 and older on Monday. And what that means is everybody who is authorized by the FDA to receive these three vaccines is eligible to receive it on Monday. And, and we we don't want to just focus on those who are newly eligible. Everybody who's been eligible from the beginning, but for whatever reason, if you haven't received your vaccine, please make your appointment. Take the first vaccine available to you because we are in a race against time. They are all safe. They are all effective. Uh, and this is how we end the pandemic. This is how we get back to normal. So we have it within our power to do this and to do it relatively soon. Um, and, and I believe that we will take advantage of it here in Louisiana. Uh, and you know we're gonna work as hard as we can every single day uh, to make sure that we're successful. Uh, so I would ask everybody to, to be mindful. Dr. Cantor mentioned this. Uh, we do have uh, Easter coming up um, and Passover as well. And to the extent that you have more people gathering, whether it's in church or whether it's, um, um, you know, in, in people's homes, uh, remember what happened uh, over the Christmas period where folks were traveling as if nothing was going on. They were gathering and having activities and so forth, they weren't safe. We have an opportunity to safely gather just take advantage of it and then have the peace of mind of knowing that you're doing that without just exposing yourself to the virus and to the disease, but, but exposing your family members or your friends or whoever else happens to be at that gathering. So let's take this all seriously. We'll do better. Uh, and, uh, we will get back to normal much sooner and I will be able to come out here. I pray. Uh, relatively soon and announce that we've had a day without deaths. That hadn't happened since about a year ago. Look, thank you all very much, and we'll see you next week. When is that, uh, Christina? Tuesday. We'll see you on Tuesday. Thank you.